Uh, we want to welcome you if you've been ever been with us before. My name is Jack Womack. I'm the past, one of the pastors here. Our other pastor is J.T. LaRue. He is a part-time pastor, and so he has other places he has to be on Sunday morning, but he uh, works with us a lot during the different kinds of things. Uh, we uh, really don't have any announcements here other than just to check on y'all and make sure everybody's okay. Uh, I think I've talked to everybody about potential damages they had, except Buddy. Buddy, y'all okay? Did y'all, Sue, did y'all have, you're okay? Yeah, good. We uh, we had one broken pipe here at the church, and it was outside. And so we didn't have any inside damage, and so we're good. Uh, we do have new chairs over to order. We've already paid for them and ordered them, but Yellow Freight has not been able to ship because of weather. I can't imagine that. And uh, so uh, I was just asked by Jerry if, if, if some of these chairs would be available when we uh, get the new ones. And the answer to that is yes. We have lots of them and they come in three sizes. I think there's only two sizes in here now. There's what we call a double and a single, but we also have some triples. And uh, I'm going to our church members get first shot at that. And then, of course, I'll let, them, let the conference know if there's churches somewhere else that need them, they can certainly have them. These are much more usable than those 10 foot long ones we had before. Uh, and so we'll be uh, able to share those with you. And, uh, that would just be our honor not to have to put them in the trash, to be able to just send them out to other places. Um, we had a chili fundraiser right before the Frozathon, and uh, we had a chance to look at the money on that. It looks like we netted about $1,695, which is pretty good uh, when you consider that in the past we had an auction and stuff to go along with it, and that always made more money, but we did okay on it. Uh, the chili, uh, by all accounts, the chili was pretty good. Pat, did you like the chili? Yeah, it was delicious. Okay, well, if you like the chili, then I know we're good. <laughs> You're good, except I missed my pie. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty good. So we are, we are glad you're with us today. Um, there is a, a, certainly a lot of stress and, and stuff in our neighborhood and people without power. Our internet is still down. It's not just us, it's everybody in the area. Um, I got word, and many of us now have been able to get a first or a second shot for the, the virus, and that's a good thing. Um, but uh, there's still a lot of people in line to get water and food, and, and our food pantry is still working. With a, thanks to the Scouts uh, food campaign, we have a good bit of food right now, and uh, but I don't think it'll be enough. So if you remember to bring a couple of canned goods with you when you come to church, we can keep that, that stocked. For those of you that haven't been here, what it is, it's a no-contact thing. We have some food outside. People can drive up and get it. They don't have to talk to anybody. They don't have to qualify. They don't have to do anything. If they need it, they take it. And some people uh, bring stuff and put in it, uh, people that we don't know. And so it's kind of been a neighborhood thing, and I'm really proud of us for doing that. Uh, many of you know who Bill Nash is. Bill is a, a guy that we work with every year to do fundraising for Champions Kids Camp. Uh, Bill contacted me yesterday afternoon and said he had the COVID virus and he had never been so sick in his whole life and requested prayer. And so we prayed for him last night and we'll pray for him again here in a little bit. Um, and as we pray for all the people that are still suffering with the, all the stuff that's going on, you know, we thought 2021 was going to be a cure for everything that happened in 2020. Uh, so far, that's not been the case, but... Uh, you know, we're going to keep living and doing what we do, and we're going to keep on having church. And um, you look around, you say, well, you got a lot of seats, preacher, and not a lot of people, but we'll have about this many or more that join us online later today when we get this uploaded. So uh, we're continuing to do that. If you don't feel safe, you shouldn't be here. Uh, we are singing again in church, and so uh, if you didn't notice, our views are six foot apart, so we, we make, we're distanced there. But if you want to sing, and we want you to if you want to, we just request you to put your mask on when you sing uh, so that we don't take any chances about that. Uh, someone pointed out to me last week that we started worship now a good while ago, face-to-face -face worship, and we've never had to shut down uh, because of a virus uh, contamination here in our church. We do disinfect the pews every day every between worship services, and we do everything we can to keep it uh, as safe as possible. But there is always risk, and so you need to do what's good for you. And we certainly understand that staying home and watching it online is better for you. Uh, other than that, the only other thing I know of is that we have delayed taking uh, Tom's remains out to the National Cemetery until the weather gets better. Uh, 
and I think that made good sense for AJ and me, and probably for Tom too. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so we'll go out to the National Cemetery sometime probably in March. Uh, anybody else have anything we need to announce or know or take care of? We're doing okay. It's good to see some of you back. We haven't seen you in a little while. Um, we look forward to uh, to worshiping with you today. And if you would, play something to warm our hearts for worship. Mm -hmm. I know we may have some folk in here that are going to want to go to summer camp this year. And so I need to know that. <laughs> yeah, and I figured you might. I didn't know if both of y'all were going or just one or whatever. So all three. Yes. Yeah, so would you would you uh, remind me of that by email or text or something? What you tell me on Sunday, I don't really remember. Um, so that because we have some funds to help with that. And so when you sign up, sign up and say you'll pay later. And then we'll do what we can, and what we can we'll do, and then of course you'll have to do the rest, but we'll, we're going to help a little bit, okay? Yeah. And it, it kind of depends on how many people are going, but I know Ginger's going, and I know Christian's going, so we have, you know, we could probably work out even transportation easily with that number of people, okay? Welcome, glad you're here. This morning our first scripture reading comes from uh, Genesis. And it's in the ninth chapter, beginning with the eighth verse. Then God said to Noah, to his sons with him, As for me, I'm establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I've set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring the clouds over the earth, 
and the bow, bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature and all flesh, and the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see and remember an everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, this morning we'll affirm our faith with the traditional Apostles' Creed. As you're able, would you please stand as we again put our mask on and say the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to Amen. Mm -hmm. 
Well, friends, when we gather to worship, we always also gather to pray. Let's join together now in prayer. Gracious and loving God, you promise strength for the weak, rest for the laborers, light for the way, grace for the trials, help from above, unfailing sympathy, undying love, creator and almighty God, help us to continue in your promise. As we go through this time of Lent, remind us that we too are sinners and that it is only through the redeeming power of Jesus Christ that we are saved. It's not through the work of the preacher or the church. It's the grace of God. And today, God, we call on you as our friend Bill Nash is suffering with this virus we call COVID-19. We ask you to bring about speedy and complete recovery. Because his mission is not complete on this planet. He has work to do to help homeless and CPS children. Those children need Bill, and we need Bill to help us to be emissaries for the grace and love of Christ in this kingdom. We also lift up prayers for all of those that have been without power and are now without water and fresh food. We lift up prayers for those that govern our state, that they can figure out what went wrong, what needs to be done, what can be done different in the future. And sometimes we Texans forget that there's other people suffering too. People in other states all across this land have been hurt by this throws a thong. So today we ask you, God, remind us of your love as we see the warmth of the sun. Remind us of your mercy and grace as we see food distributions and water distributions and the people of our country responding to those in need. And in all of the midst of that, remind us also that we too need to be saved. That we need to be forgiven. And we ask you now to forgive us for all the things that we have done, the sins of commission as well as the sins of omission. And we remember Jesus who taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may remain, uh, actually, I'm going to have you stand, if you will, as we sing. There is a balm in Gilead, and then remain standing for the reading of the gospel.
Reading this morning from the Gospel of Mark in the ninth, no, excuse me, in the first chapter of the ninth verse. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven You're my son, the beloved, with you I'm well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beast, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. <clears throat> Repent, and believe in the good news. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. And you may be seated. I want to read another passage too, just because it's not all, it won't be on the screen, Johnny. So um, it comes from First Peter, and it's in the third chapter, with the 18th verse. It's very short, and it goes like this: For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteousness for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh and made alive in the spirit in which he also went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison who in former times did not obey God when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through water. In baptism, which this prefigure now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven, and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. These three scriptures fit together to remind us what happened after the ark when God said, I will never again flood the earth. I will have my covenant be everlasting with you. And it always was interesting to me when I was a seminary to hear about everlasting covenants because we kind of get a sense that everlasting means never ending. Well, God's covenant is everlasting. However, our commitment to the covenant has not been so everlasting. We humans have broken the covenant a number of times. And we continue to do so today. And so when you look at the first part of the scripture from Genesis, we're reminded that God made a promise. And we look at Jesus being baptized and we realize this is the beginning of his ministry. This is very early in the Gospel of Mark. Mark is probably the first of the Gospels written and it's much more uh, cut, cut to the chase than some of the other ones, less flowery language, because keep in mind that the people hearing the Gospel of Mark actually knew the story. This may have only been, oh, a few years after Jesus went back to heaven. And so, you know, I would place it somewhere maybe around 45 to 50. And so if Jesus was 34 when he went back to heaven, that would just give you an idea. Most of the people living knew the story. So it doesn't go in like Luke or Matthew into the whole thing about the temptation and what all that meant. They don't need to know that. They've heard the stories. And it reminds us that, that when Jesus comes and he professes his ministry, he gives us the message right then, the message of Lent. Repent and believe the gospel. Now repent, that's an interesting word. We all kind of know what it means. We tell our kids to repent when they get in trouble at school or somewhere else, it really technically means change directions. But in the Christian context, what it means is change directions and turn toward God. That's a little bit different than just changing directions. If you're going the wrong way, you know, 180 degrees from the wrong way can still be the wrong way. What we're required to do is to, to make a turn toward God. Why? Because we're supposed to believe that the kingdom of God has come near and we're supposed to repent and believe the gospel. So Lent's always an interesting time for me. Uh, it's a time when we, people spend a great deal of time when we don't have a pandemic. I mean, we've already begun our fasting, right? We fasted from water, electricity, heat, and uh, sunny weather. I mean, we're already well into our way into Lent, the fasting. And so many times for me over the years of being a preacher, Lent has been all about the things I give up. 
And you'll hear people talk about it. You know, well, I gave up desserts for Lent or I gave up caffeine for Lent or, or whatever the thing is. And I think that's fine. But, but I think the reason I injected the first Peter passage in there is that there's something else going on in our life. Another place in the scriptures, it says, if you have a physical body, then you also have been given a spiritual body. And so we are in constant conflict within ourselves of our physical body and our spiritual body. It's a constant fight between our physical self, which is the one that sins and creates all kinds of havoc in the world, and our spiritual body, which is trying to aim us and turn us toward God. If you have a GPS, you kind of know what I'm talking about. So you set your GPS to go from here to wherever you're going, and you decide in your infinite wisdom that the GPS is wrong. And so you decide to go a different way. And the little voice, if you have, I have mine turned off because I don't like to hear it. But if you have a little voice on there, it says rerouting, rerouting. And I get a sense that Lent is that time for us to reroute, to, to look at the way we're going. Are we really going about our lives in the way God called us to? Or are we going about the lives like we want? And I think sometimes that's what you see when we get into the arguments that we have with the human family over all of the physical stuff. You know, do I have enough money to retire? Or are we doing things the right way? That, that's all the good stuff. But it has very little to do with the spiritual side, which on the other side is trying to say, have you done everything you can to be closer to Jesus Christ? Are you living your life in a way that brings you closer to God? Or are you living in your life in a way that takes you further away from God? The hardest part for us church people to swallow, I think, is that, yeah, he's talking to us too. Because we're sinners. We do stuff. Some of our thoughts are not pure. And our actions often follow our thoughts. I was telling uh, Pastor JT the other day, you know, there was, we were talking about uh, whether somebody in the world out there was going to go to heaven or not. And I said, well, sometimes my problem, JT, is that uh, I don't know if they're going to heaven or not, but my problem is I don't care if they're going or not. You see, that's where I fall into the trap of sin. I should care that every single person out there should be saved. That's what I think God intended when he sent Jesus Christ to earth. I think that's what we're supposed to do. I think that's what we're doing when our spiritual self takes over. We understand that, yeah, some people don't live the way we want, but God still loves them anyway. Some people don't behave the way we want, but you know what? God still loves them anyway. God doesn't pick out a select group and say, I love you more than others. And that's the tough pill to swallow when there's people out there living and doing stuff like we just can't stand. We detest them. And we detest their behavior, but we can't detest their spiritual self. We've got to love and care for them and wish the best for them and hope somehow to get them into the, the, the people that understand who Jesus is. I grew up in, a, in the Methodist church, but I also grew up in an understanding that, that uh, you know, salvation is a thing you have to work on all the time. It's not a thing that's just a given. One day you wake up and you're saved. Now, there is a day for most of us that we walk in front of a church somewhere and we make a profession of faith and we get baptized, you know, either in the Methodist church, we baptize infants or whatever. If we do an infant, then they're, they're required at an older age to come up and accept it. You know, if you grew up Catholic, you know what that's like too, and Episcopalian and Lutheran, it's kind of the same in all of those. But, but the thing is, we, that one event is important, but it comes into to place in the in the whole storyline, not just as the end of the story. And so the storyline is that God is at work in your life from the moment you're knitted together in your mother's womb. We know that's true. The scriptures tell us that's true. And then we know that there is a time when many of us, and I wish all of us, came to realize that God is God and God's plan for us has helped us to survive all the stuff we did when we were doing the other stuff when we were growing up, when we were walking away from the church or we were walking away from the teachings of the Bible. And you know, we all have. But that moment in time when we're justified is that time when we, we sort of, for at least an instant, the light bulb comes on and we say, yeah, you know, there was stuff that happened. By the grace of God, I'm not in jail or in prison or, or killed in a car wreck or whatever. 
And we realize that's true. And, and that's, that's what we call justification. But friends, that's not even the end. That's just really the beginning of the story. Because starting then, we now have God in our lives. We have an awareness of God's plan for us. We have an awareness that God wants the best for us. And we live a life of being sanctified or moved closer to God. So if you could superimpose the spiritual and the physical body, our desire is that they come closer and closer and closer together so that our spiritual body and our physical body are lined up together. And when that happens, then we move toward what Wesley called perfection, which would have that mind of Christ. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, he said he never attained that, but he knew people that had and I think we know people that maybe even just for an instant, we've seen people with the mind of Christ, you know, uh, and they may not even know it. Sometimes people have to point it out. You know, there are people out there who, who do good things and they don't really know why they're doing them. They just do them and they need to be, they need to be made aware that, that Christ is calling you into a different life. And, 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 and I was, I just can't even imagine what it would be like for those people that have no hope that have no Jesus, that have no hope of God when things go wrong. You know, when, when, when the lights are out and the power's out and the, the water's not running and there's no food at the grocery store and you can't get gas anywhere and if the station does have gas, they don't have power. What do we do? Do we just throw up our hands or do we believe that this too shall pass and we'll get through this and we'll move forward to something else? So many people have been that way in this last year about 2020 and, and the COVID virus and, 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 and just, you know, we want it all to go back like it was and, and, and it can't. It never will go back exactly like it was. It's going to be like it is. But, you know, it's not like it was either. When I was a kid growing up, we didn't have air conditioning. I'm sure glad we're not there anymore. Amen. You know, when, when I was a kid, my first car didn't have air conditioning and it had a little bitty motor and it had a standard shift that wasn't synchronized and you couldn't go into first gear unless you stopped all the way stopped and and there wasn't any you couldn't go through a rust stop sign because you couldn't get it back at first till you stopped <laughs> had that argument with a policeman one time i mean i don't want to go back to that i don't want to go back to to some of the stuff that i used to do and, and some of that sometimes uh keeps me from seeing what I can do in the future. I have really kind of two stories. Uh, one of them I've told a number of times, but Leonard Freeman is a man that I met some years ago. Uh, he is a, uh, an African-American Christian artist. He gave up his secular life to just be a Christian artist, to do just work for God. So when I was in seminary, they asked me to uh, interview a person that had given up a secular career to work for God. And, and uh, you know, I knew a number of second career preachers, but I was really looking for something else, somebody that was either into music or something. And so I had met Leonard sometime before. I called him up and said, can we like have lunch and let me interview you for this deal? And we sat around in a restaurant. He's almost exactly the same age as me. At that time in his life, he had really long dreadlocks and carried sort of a purse. He was an interesting looking fellow. He's cleaned up now. <laughs> but, uh, but Leonard uh, and I sat there and we, we discovered that we really had almost carbon copies of each other's lives. You know, we, were, we almost had the same grandmother with different parents. It was just, uh, when I talked about my grandmother knowing how to go get a switch out of the backyard to use it on me, she knew, ex he knew his grandma did the same thing. When I talked about a life where my, my, my friends would call and say, hey, we're all going over to the putt-putt golf. And I'd say, well, I can't go until me and mom and dad sit down to eat because we have to eat together as a family. He knew what that was like. And I asked him, so, so where did Christ get into your picture? And he said, well, he said, I had a sister who was always wanting me to go to church. So he said, one day she was having a party and some of her friends came over and we were all swimming in her apartment. And there were some pretty cute girls there. And I said, well, where did you meet all those girls? She said, oh, they go to church with me. He said, I'm in. We're going Sunday. <laughs> and so they went to church. And so yeah, I don't know how many times he went, but one of the Sundays he was sitting there uh, as they were during the preacher was preaching. Uh, he started nudging his sister. He said, have you been telling him about me? 
Have you been telling him about me? He's talking to me. And so when the service was over, he felt his knees tremble. And, and he didn't know why, really, but he went up to the front of the church. And uh, the preacher said, well, what do you want? He said, I want to be a part of this. And he said, well, you want to be baptized? And he said, well, sure. So they just, and that was a Baptist church. And that church, they dismissed the church. And anybody who wanted to stay could stay. And so Leonard went up and got into the baptismal, which was up at the back of the church. And uh, he described it. You had to go through the choir room, up the stairs, and into this kind of comfortable warm water. And, uh, and he was there. And, and so the preacher took him and dunked him under the water and brought him up. He said, what do I do now? He said, say, praise Jesus. He praised Jesus. They did that three times, you know, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and so he said, what do I do now? He said, just raise your hand and say, praise Jesus. So Leonard's up there, praise Jesus, soaking wet. And he, he comes down into the choir room and collapsed on the floor. And the associate pastor said, Leonard was wrong and he couldn't talk. He was groaning, making weird noises. And he went and got the senior pastor and he said, what's up with Leonard? Do we need to call 9-1? And he said, no, no. He said, uh, God's just doing a work on him. Well, Leonard got up from that place and he said his life absolutely from that moment in time, that would be a period of justification. His life changed. He said, everything didn't change that minute. My use of alcohol tapered off. My language still needed some correction. But I could see it in myself from that point on. I was no longer oblivious to what was going on. And henceforth, he went into Christian ministry by the way of his art. Uh, have, we have two pieces of it hanging in our house. It's, it's incredible stuff. I met him the first time some years ago in Laporte at the, at, during Black History Month. And uh, he came out and told his story. You know, I think the stories like that is what we hear, want to hear. But let me tell you, for most of us, it never happens suddenly. It happens very gradually. In fact, sometimes you don't even realize it's happening to you. But somebody that you know you haven't seen for a while, you know, you'll, you'll hang out with them a little while. They say, what happened to you? You seem different. You might seem more at peace. You might seem happier. You might seem, you know, easier to get along with. And part of that happens when we begin the transformation of becoming a follower, not a fan of Jesus Christ. So we have Lent. You know, Lent is the 40 days before Easter. Doesn't count Sundays. Probably not a secret that Jesus was in the tempted by the devil for 40 days. We have that 40 days of what we call repentance. And the words we most often hear are, we hear things like, uh, from dust you came, from dust you must return. And we also hear things like repent and believe the gospel. So what is the gospel message? Can you imagine what it would be like to, to be a, a Buddhist who has no belief in God? They, they, they don't believe in God at all. They simply have a transformation or to, to move into eternity. So they, they, have, they have interesting things like you can't step into the same river twice. Uh, they're looking for nirvana. Now, actually, a Buddhist can become a Christian because they, it's not a conflict. They're, they're not trying to, uh, to change gods. They just are getting God for the first time. But can you imagine being a Buddhist and having a, an 8 or a 10 or a 12-year-old child die tragically from either a medical problem or an accident? And, and, the, and the, the leader of the congregation or whatever they call it just simply says, Well, and Johnny was a little good, good little kid. And he's gone. That's not the way we Christians live, is it? You see, what we know is, yeah, that physical light, that physical body, sometimes the light goes out. And we know when it does, God lights it for all eternity. That's why we have Lent. So we can realize that us church people, we too need to repent. In fact, the global church needs to repent. The church has not always been kind. We've told people, you know, do this or you're going to hell. I would much rather tell somebody do this so you can go to heaven. And I would also like for people to understand that heaven happens right here. We just prayed it in the Lord's Prayer. We prayed for that God's kingdom to come on earth the way it is in heaven. And one of the reasons I love Bill Nash and Champions Kids Camp so much is he takes about 200 CPS children that have very little hope. And he calls them champions. They don't know what a champion is. 
but he calls them champions. And he's been doing that now for 17 or 18 or 19 years. And kids that he took there 17 years ago now are counselors in his camp. And they're helping other children with what we call transformation. So a few years ago, uh, several of us from the church went out to Champions Kids Camp in the summer. And it was wonderful. They were they had a camp down in Alvin and they had everything. It was a, it was a young person's delight. It had go-karts. It had a train. It had a, a zip line. It was just incredible. And so Bill was taking us on a tour and he said something to Kathy about, oh, y'all ought to try the zip line. And I think it was her that said, yeah, let's do it. Is that right? Was it you? I think so. Yeah. And so we go over there and uh, we did those things you should never do, but we bumped everybody in line and he sent us up a spiral stairway like this. It went up 80 feet. <laughs> now it didn't look so bad when you were in the stairway. Right, Faye? <laughs> you, you couldn't see out from the stairway. It just was going up a little circle. And when we got up on the top, there wasn't a rail. They took this seat belt we had on, they hooked it to a cable, and they said, sit down there on the edge. And we did. And then they said, now y'all all three had three lines, you and Kathy and Faye, y'all all scoot off at the same time, riding zip lines. Well, I went and they did, so they eventually came. <laughs> And Johnny was down there at the other end of the thing, and he looked about that big. So you got a picture of it. Well, here's what happens with Champions Kids Camp. On Monday, a number of little children go up the spiral stairway. They get to the top, and they look out, and they say, oops, not me. And they go back down. He said, by Wednesday, they usually have them sitting on the ledge. They still get up and go back down. And by Friday, they've been convinced of the success rate that nobody's fallen off yet. And so then they're able to ride down and he builds confidence for them. I want to tell you, friends, in my opinion, that's heaven on earth. Amen. That's when kids are transformed from hopeless, helpless, and not having any chance in their life to having the hope of being able to live and move on. Now, Bill ties all of that together with Christ when they do it. Most of the music they sing is Christian and so forth and so on. So we live in this time where we're called to do that same thing. We go out in different ways. Some of us work in schools or plants or wherever we work. Some of us are retired and never get a day off. Wherever we are, we're doing what we do. But we have a responsibility to do what Bill did, to build people up, not to tear them down. If we can build them up, they'll be interested in coming to Christ. It's when you scare them and use fear and tactics like that that they think, well, no wonder nobody wants to go. So here we are at a time when everybody's saying, well, you know, we're trying to get back to church. Well, let me just tell you, this has been going on. I've been preaching for about 20 years. This has been going on almost the whole time. The population in the area where I live is increasing. The church attendance is decreasing. At first, we used to make excuses. You know, well, that family grew up and they moved away. This happened. That way, you know, they're doing t-ball on Sundays or volleyball or whatever it is. We made excuses, but those exactly what those were. The reality is that the church has, in some ways, failed to meet the needs, the spiritual needs of the communities and where they live. And if you can't meet the spiritual needs, then having a Starbucks coffee bar and a fancy playground don't mean anything. The spiritual needs are the ones that we need to feed. I know that in, in my estimation, we get a kid, if we get a kid at all in church in normal times, we get them for two hours, like we have for an hour for Sunday school, an hour for church. If we're going to get them for that time, we don't need to be entertaining them. We need to tell them about who Jesus is so that when they grow up, they know who Jesus is. When they get into that time when things aren't going the way they're supposed to, they have a chance to repent, to turn toward God. But if they don't know who God is, they'll never make that turn. And I can believe that there's at least three generations of those kids living among us right now. I think we lost our way. And I think it's time for us to get our way back. And so as I personally will be repenting for the next six weeks, I ask you to repent and to believe the gospel and to, to look at your own life in the ways that you need to confess. Not to me. But to God, that the ways you need to turn around, not towards something new and different and more exciting, but toward the God that can 
with, spend time with you and save you for all eternity. You see, that's where we get the hope to know that when that candle goes out, it's being relit because the spiritual body reigns and lives on eternally. So Jesus goes to the river and he gets baptized. A lot of stuff happens. And then he looks up and he says, friends, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the gospel. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So we're going to sing now. Uh, if you're willing to put your mask on, you can stand as we close our service with Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. Let me just say this. We're, some things we're not doing. We're not passing offering plates because it's not a good thing to do. We don't hand out bulletins because we're not supposed to touch them all. Um, we do have an offering. It's in the back. It's in a basket. We gladly accept your gifts, tithes, and offerings there. Uh, friends, it's been a joy to be with you today. Uh, if, you know, if you've never accepted Christ, today's a good day to do it. And let's uh, get together and sing this, this song. Blessed be the time that finds. Blessed be the time that finds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of King and great minds is like to the head of love. uncertainties the grace to ask what you would have us do that we may be saved from all false choices that in your light we may see light and in your straight path we may not stumble through Jesus Christ our Lord Amen, Amen. Amen. Friends go in peace Amen.